I'm going to introduce um, someone who really doesn't need an introduction around this school, uh, and, uh, but some of you are not from here. It's Dean Doug Sylvester. Um, he is the dean of the law school. He has been for, I believe, five years now, right? Pardon? How many years? Seven years. Seven years. Um, time flies. Um, under his leadership, um, this is I'm looking at the wrong piece of paper. Under his leadership, a number of things have happened. ASU has um, increased its rankings dramatically, um, and he has played a key role in it. Um, he has um, played host over 400 events um, since the grand opening of the Buse Center for Law and Society. Um, Arizona is now ranked the law school here, um, top 10 among all public law schools, and has five specialty programs in the top 30. Um, it is uh, number five in the country um, as far as bass, yeah, bar pass difference, and top 20 for employment for five years straight. Um, his leadership truly um, stands out. Um, ASU law students voluntarily donate more than 100,000 hours of community service each year. Roddy Duncan's class, did you hear that? 100,000. Um, we have uh, raised over $60 million in the past, or they have raised over $60 million in the past six years, greatly supporting the student scholarships and the law programs. That's what Dean Sylvester has done for this law school. He has made it a world-class institution, um, truly. And so, Dean Sylvester, if you would please come up to say a few words. Happy Law Day, everybody. Um, thank you, Dave, that was uh, very kind. The law school has done a number of extraordinary things really over the last 10 years, and I think uh, anyone who knows me knows that I have very little to do with it. We are surrounded by an incredible staff, Austin and, and Jonathan and Lynn and other people that are here tonight are just one example of people who keep staying after hours to make sure that the things that this building and this law school stand for will continue to advance. I mean, when we talked about, we were just talking a second ago about the move here downtown and how has it really turned out for the law school. And I can only say unequivocally, fantastically. And the reason for that is why we moved downtown wasn't just to get a slightly nicer facility than what we had in Tempe, but really so that we could become a center for law and society. It is the name of the building. I remember meeting with our architects back in 2014 or 2013, I think, and they were telling you, you know, why do you want to move downtown? What are you hoping for? And I was saying, you know, what I really hope is that this institution, this facility becomes a real focus for intersections between law and society, that we become a true convener of issues and topics of pressing importance here in the city, the state, the country, and the globe. And this is a place where people can come and learn about law, learn about its importance, learn about its role in every aspect of our life, both historical, contemporary, and into the future. And I think today's event is another wonderful example of what Arizona State University, the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law can do, and our legal community can do to continue to make us think about law's importance and role in every one of our lives. And so the other thing that I can do as Dean is get off stage and let you actually listen to what you're here to do. Uh, and before I do that, I want to introduce uh, judge Janet Barton. Uh, judge Barton is the presiding judge here, the Mar Maricopa County uh, Superior Court, uh, supervising 26 attorneys and 26 uh, or 26 judges and 26 uh, magistrates. And what I think is most important about Judge Barton is that she constantly follows me in these events. This is what I think the third event in about a month where I get up and talk and you're really tired of that and then you get up and talk and really do uh, add a level of gravitas that I lack at every single part of my being. And so with that, uh, Judge Barton, come on up please and I hope you all have a great evening. And before I go back to work tomorrow and I have a bunch of judges call me up and want to know if they've been fired, we, we actually have uh, 63 commissioners and 98 judges on our bench. <laughs> the, the, 20, <laughs> the 26 is the justices of the peace in Maricopa County and they have 26 uh, magistrates or constables as well. So I just want to make sure all the judges who are here know that they are still employed tomorrow. 
Um, but I am here because I have the distinct pleasure of introducing uh, Chief Justice or Retired Justice uh, Ruth McGregor. But before I get to that, I would be really remiss if I didn't recognize David Goss. And David is one of the judges on our bench, and he is uh, the individual who put this program together for the court for Law Day. And David just does an incredible job in putting these programs together. And he was talking about how he wanted to uh, transition maybe to get someone else involved uh, in future years. And I said, yeah, so when you retire, you won't have to do this anymore. But uh, I have to keep him involved for quite a few years because he does such a great job. So David, thank you so much. So now let's talk about Ruth. She asked me to be short. So I could probably sum it up by just saying she's an incredible woman, and I'm really honored to have her as someone who has supported me over the years and been a friend. But she really deserves a little more time than that, so I'm going to give her a little more time. Uh, um, Justice McGregor, I, have to, I usually call her Ruth, so I have to keep remembering. I should call her Justice McGregor in these formal occasions. Uh, Justice McGregor uh, got her undergraduate degree and a master's degree at the University of Iowa. Uh, she went, into law, went on to law school here in Arizona at the ASU College of Law. That was before it became the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. Um, and she also got a master's from the University of Virginia, and she got uh, that master in judicial process. Uh, she worked in private practice before she began her judicial career, and she worked for the law firm of Fenimore Craig. She was a member of that firm. Uh, she also has the distinct honor of having been Sandra Day O'Connor, Justice O'Connor's first law clerk. And uh, she came and spoke to our bench once about what it was like because she did not follow the traditional law clerk path. She, uh, I think we were a partner at Fenimore, weren't you, when she became uh, Justice O'Connor's first law clerk. And she came and spoke to our bench about it, and it was uh, one of the most interesting discussions uh, I've, I've heard from her on, on that topic. It was really fascinating to hear her talk about being a law clerk and coming from that non-traditional path and being the law clerk for the first female justice on the United States Supreme Court. Uh, she started her judicial career here in Arizona as a judge on the Arizona Court of Appeals, and she was a judge on that court from 1989 to 1998, and she was the chief judge on that court from 1995 to 1997. She then went on to the Arizona Supreme Court, and she served on that court from February of 1998 until she retired in June of 2009. And her last four years on that court, she did serve as the chief justice for the um, uh, Arizona Supreme Court. And I would also be remiss if I didn't point out, because of our setting here, that she is the first graduate of the ASU College of Law to be appointed to the Arizona Supreme Court. Uh, as far as her um, activities, She's always had a passion for being involved in participating in professional activities that have an emphasis on involving legal education and in organizations that are dedicated to assuring a fair and impartial judiciary. Um, she has received numerous awards because of her distinguished career. Uh, she's re received awards from the State Bar of Arizona, the Arizona Women's Lawyer Association, the Arizona Ends of Court Foundation, the Arizona Judicature Society, the United States Chamber of Commerce, the Arizona Women's Foundation, the University of Iowa, and the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. So you can see why I tell you that she is such an incredible woman, and I can't think of a, a better person to uh, moderate this discussion here today, and I want to thank her for giving up her time in doing this. So, Justice McGregor. Thank you, Janet. That was not short. <laughs> First, welcome all of you to this Law Day program. We celebrate Law Day each May 1st in this country, and it provides us an opportunity to remind ourselves of the importance of living in a country that is governed by the rule of law and not of men.
It's also important to remind ourselves of our individual and collective responsibility for assuring that we remain a country ruled by laws, not by the personal whim of any person, no matter how powerful. This year's emphasis for Law Day is on the separation of powers, which indeed has provided a framework for maintaining our freedoms and our democracy. Our separation of powers, properly exercised, assures us that the governmental power does not become concentrated in one branch, and that if one branch of government unduly exercises its powers, that, that undue exercise of powers can be reversed or, or by the other branches of government acting as, as they should. One of the checks, the primary check, the judicial branch uses on the political branches is its ability to determine whether laws or executive orders or regulations violate the terms of the Constitution, which is the supreme law of our land. If laws are violative of the Constitution, they must be struck down by the court system and held void. Now, some of the most memorable decisions of the United States Supreme Court are those in which the court struck down legislation, whether federal or state, as being violative of the Equal Protection Clause of the United States Constitution. Those decisions do not always come easily or quickly, as many of you are aware. For instance, it took the court more than 50 years to correct its holding in the 1896 decision of Plessy versus Ferguson, which held that separate facilities could be separated by race so long as they were equal. In 1954, the court finally reversed that holding in Brown versus Board of Education, holding that facilities separated by race are inherently unequal and violate the Equal Protection Clause. The court required a little less time, but still more than 30 years, to reverse its decision in Bowers versus Hardwick, when it held in Lawrence versus Texas that criminal anti-sodomy statutes as applied to consenting adults violated the liberty interest of the substantive due process clause. So to paraphrase Dr. King, the arc of judicial thinking may be long, but it does incline toward justice. The discussion today relates to other decisions from 1944 of the Supreme Court that nearly all now regard as wrongly decided, but which the court never had uh, an, an opportunity to directly address, and which has been brought into sharp focus by recent events about which we will speak later. You will hear more detail in a moment, but let me give you a broad summary. In 1942, pursuant to executive and military orders, all West Coast persons of Japanese ancestry, including American citizens, were first subjected to curfews and then ordered to report to assembly or control stations and subsequently to internment camps, which eventually housed more than 120,000 people. Several young men of Japanese descent, all citizens, challenged these orders, which led to their criminal misdemeanor convictions in cases that actually reached the United States Supreme Court in 1944. Over vigorous dissents, the court upheld the convictions, concluding that the restrictions were based not on race or ancestry, but upon military conclusions that the internment of those of Japanese ancestry, without giving any individualized consideration about loyalty, was justified as a military necessity, a military judgment that the court did not feel inclined to review. The dissenting justices spoke in rather incredulous terms, not much heard before the advent of Justice Scalia. And the justices pointed out that the defendant's actions were crimes only because they were of Japanese origin and that the opinion was no more than the legalization of racism. And that is where things remained until the 1980s, when the paths of our two speakers crossed in an unexpected way. Judge Mary Schroeder came to Arizona after her graduation from the University of Chicago Law School and four years spent as a trial attorney at the United States Department of Justice. After several years in private practice, she was appointed to the Arizona Court of Appeals under our then new merit selection system. In 1979, she was appointed to the, uh, the Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, where she 
she served as chief judge beginning in 2000, when she was the first woman to serve as chief judge of the Ninth Circuit. She took senior status in 2012 and remains very active on the Ninth Circuit. In 1987, while Judge Schroeder was on the court, a group of quorum nobis actions, and for those of you who are law lawyers or law students, you'll hear about these, but if you're like me, you'd have to go look it up to see what it means. Anyway, a group of quorum nobis actions were filed in district court, three different district courts, by three Japanese American men who had been convicted in 1942, and those cases eventually reached the Ninth Circuit. The actions decided in an opinion authored by Judge Schroeder, and for reasons she will explain, finally vacated the 45-year-old convictions. Judge Schroeder has described that opinion as the case of a lifetime, as the court helped finally rectify one of our nation's greatest wrongs. Now, Karen Korematsu, our second speaker, awaited the Ninth Circuit's decision with great interest, as she is the daughter of Fred Korematsu, one of the men convicted in 1944, 42 who brought a quorum nobis action in, 19, in the 1980s. She has followed her father's footsteps as a civil rights advocate, a public speaker, and a public educator. In 2009, on the 25th anniversary of the Ninth, court, Ninth Circuit's decision reversing her father's conviction, she established the Fred E. Korematsu Institute, where she serves as executive director. The work of the Institute extends to advocating for civil liberties of all communities and educating about lessons we can and must draw from the past. The Institute files and signs on to amicus briefs in cases related to its mission, including a brief in the recently argued travel ban case, Trump versus Hawaii. We are honored to have her with us. As you will learn, the cases we will hear about today involve not only legal, legal, equal protection issues and human losses, human issues of extreme loss, but also tales of governmental misconduct and misrepresentation, and finally, we hope, of commitment to justice and the rule of law. Judge Schroeder. Thank you very much, Justice McGregor. It's really an honor to be here on Law Day with my good friend, Ruth McGregor, and with my friend, Karen Kuramatsu, who is really fighting the good fight uh, that uh, she knows uh, is born of a, a very uh, tragic history. And so uh, I'd just like to ask how many, just uh, for the heck of it, how many people here actually studied the Japanese internment before they got to law school? A few. And how many people here have been to Pearl Harbor? Well, that's, that's a lot. Uh, it, I, I encourage any of you who have not to, to visit it because it is a memorable experience. Uh, this whole uh, saga began, of course, when the Japanese Empire bombed Pearl Harbor, Hawaii on December 7th, 1941, the day that President Roosevelt pronounced was a day that will live in infamy. And that same day, President Roosevelt issued a proclamation delegating authority to the Attorney General and the Secretary of War to curtail the liberty of enemy aliens. And a little later, he signed the now famous Executive Order Number 9066, delegating authority to the military to exclude anyone from military areas. And with respect to the West Coast, which was considered a military area after Pearl Harbor, the Secretary of War designated, delegated his authority to, to a man named General John DeWitt, who was the commanding general of Western Defense uh, the Western Defense Command, and it was General DeWitt who was to determine what action should be taken in the name of its, uh, security uh, uh, with respect to excluding people from that area. And it was General Witt who had issued the order in March 1942 that as a matter of military necessity, all German and Italian aliens, German and Italian non-citizens, 
and all persons of Japanese ancestry, whether aliens or citizens, must first obey curfews and report for evacuation from the military areas. So I repeat, it was German and Italian aliens, Japanese aliens, as well as Japanese American citizens who were all to be evacuated. And the West Coast included all of the Western states, including Phoenix, south of Van Buren. So those Japanese Americans living north of Van Buren were not evacuated. And the, as Judge Justice McGregor has said, there were three young men, Gordon Hirabayashi in Seattle, Fred Korematsu in the Bay Area, and Minori Yasui in Portland, who refused to report for the curfew and the evacuation. Hirabayashi was a student at the University of Washington, had been born in the United States, and although his parents had been born in Japan, he had never even written to anyone in Japan. And all three of these young men were convicted of misdemeanors, and all three challenged the convictions all the way to the Supreme Court, where they lost. And for those of you who are not familiar with the Ninth Circuit, the Ninth Circuit includes all of the Western United States, including Hawaii and Alaska, and Arizona and California. Um, and so it includes uh, all three of the jurisdictions in which those young men were convicted. Now, in Hirabayashi's case, which was the first to reach the Supreme Court, he first appealed to our court, which is the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And he argued in our court that as an American citizen, he couldn't be prosecuted based on his ethnic heritage. Think about it. I thought that was, I think that's a pretty good argument. And our court in 1943 thought it was a pretty good argument too, and so we didn't decide the case. Instead, we certified it to the United States to Supreme, to the, to the United States Supreme Court. And I, I, it's hard for us to imagine how high uh, the sentiment was against Japanese in, at that time. There were cartoons, there were uh, songs, there were uh, attacks in the papers, uh, and pamphlets. It was, it was quite a, 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 a very bad time. And when his case got to the Supreme Court, um, the Supreme Court upheld his con convictions on the grounds of wartime security. And their opinion was actually based on the report of General DeWitt, a report that said that some Japanese Americans were disloyal, but the military wasn't able and didn't have time to figure out which ones were. So they had to, uh, they had to evacuate and in, in turn, as, as, as is now described, incarcerate all Japanese Americans. And they excluded them all from the West Coast and put them in camps. And Justice Douglas, that was a unanimous decision. Justice Douglas was anguished by it, and he wrote a special concurrence. And he said, where the peril is great and the time is short, temporary treatment in a group basis may be, only may be the only practicable expedient, whatever the ultimate percentage of those who are detained for cause. In other words, it doesn't matter how many really are uh, disloyal is if, 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 if in expediency we have to uh, lock them all up. So um, the Korematsu case was the next case. It, it was from the district court in San Francisco where Fred Korematsu was convicted. He appealed to the Ninth Circuit to our court and our court affirmed his conviction on the basis of Hirabayashi's case and Fred Karamatsu's case got to the Supreme Court in 1944. And by this time, the Supreme Court knew the war would be won. And I think it knew that the internment was wrong. By a vote of six to three, the Supreme Court upheld Korematsu's conviction. And he, the court said, the majority opinion said, written by Justice Black, who was known as, as, as an advocate for in, in his, 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 his uh, 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 legacy is as an advocate of civil rights and civil liberties, but he wrote the majority opinion and said Korematsu had been properly excluded because Congress, quote, reposing its confidence in this time of war in our military leaders determined the power was necessary because there was evidence of disloyalty on the part of some and time was short. So we're back to the DeWitt report. There was evidence of disloyalty and time was short so we had to exclude all Japanese American citizens. And the fact is that no Japanese Americans ever displayed any disloyalty whatsoever. So when we jump forward to 40 years 
to the early 1980s. An historian was rummaging through the National Archives, a Japanese American historian, and came across an earlier and previously unknown copy of the DeWitt Report. And it was different from the DeWitt Report that had been presented to the Supreme Court in the Korematsu case. It did not say that there was evidence that some Japanese Americans were disloyal and that there wasn't time to figure out which ones were disloyal. The original report had said that all Japanese Americans had to be excluded because of traits peculiar to Japanese ancestry. In other words, the report was completely based on race. <coughs> And the War Department had caused the original race-based report to be changed so that instead of relying on ancestral traits, that is race, the, the final DeWitt report relied uh, on false evidence that some Japanese Americans were disloyal and there wasn't time to separate from them from the loyal ones. And when the original report was discovered in about 1982, Korematsu, Hirabayashi, and Yasui all filed suit in their respective district courts to have their wartime convictions vacated. Um, those of you who are familiar with uh, writs know that habeas corpus is the most common writ used in our courts. Um, habeas corpus means you have the body. Uh, habeas corpus was not available to these men because uh, they, their sentences had ended a long time ago. The government no longer had their bodies. So this unusual writ of quorum nobis that, that Justice McGregor referred to was used. And um, the writ of quorum nobis, it can be used where there's been a fundamental miscarriage of justice. And in Gordon Hirabayashi's case, the judge in, uh, who heard that case in Seattle in the 1980s uh, held a lengthy trial, and that trial brought out all the facts of the suppression of the original uh, DeWitt report and the substitution of the altered report. And so that even though the War Department thought it had destroyed all the copies of the original report because it wanted to hide them, uh, it hadn't quite done so. The 1980s Korematsu court case uh, came in San Fran came to a wonderful judge in Cal in uh, San Francisco, Marilyn Patel, who was a good friend and who had labored in the women's movement of the 70s. She was a lawyer for the National Organization for Women. And the government uh, argued to Judge Patel that wartime necessity was uh, was behind the, the uh, conviction of Korematsu and tried to defend the Supreme Court's decision against Korematsu's attack that his conviction had been based on fundamental errors that created a, a miscarriage of justice. And Judge Patel just didn't buy the government's argument at all and held in favor of Korematsu. And she said, uh, and I quote Marilyn Patel, that the Supreme Court opinion in the Korematsu case in 1944 stands as a caution that in times of distress, the shield of military necessity and national security must not be used to protect governmental actions from close scrutiny and accountability. I think that's pretty good. The government, after it lost the Korematsu case before uh, Judge Patel, did not appeal her decision to the Ninth Circuit. So when Hirabayashi's case was tried in Seattle, before Judge uh, Voorhees. Um, he, Kormats, uh, Hirabayashi had been convicted of two misdemeanors. One was failing to report for the curfew, and the other was failing to report for the exclusion. And Judge Voorhees was a very careful man, and what he did after his trial was to say that the, ex essentially, that the exclusion of Japanese American citizens was uncon had been unconstitutional, but he only vacated one conviction. He vacated the conviction for uh, the failure to report for the exclusion, and he left standing the conviction for the failure to follow the curfew. Now, why did he do that? Um, he split the baby. Why did he? I think he was concerned that since the Korematsu case had not been appealed to the Ninth Circuit, that he wanted to assure that the Hirabayashi case would. And so, uh, he, so he, he, he held in favor of the government on one of the cases and against it on the other uh, in the hopes of appeal. And of course, both sides appealed to the Ninth Circuit. 
So it came to us very dramatically in 1987. It was a sunny day in Seattle. Gordon, Gordon Hirabayashi was in the courtroom. And, it the, and his case was heard before a diverse panel in 1987 that could not have existed 10 years before uh, when the federal judiciary was almost completely uh, white and male. And th that panel that heard the case was a white male, uh, Judge Ted Goodwin of Portland, Oregon, uh, an African-American male in uh, Jerry Ferris of Seattle, and a white woman, me. And unlike in the Korematsu case, where the government tried to argue that the original wartime conviction was all right on the merits, or tried to say, let's just agree to, to reverse it and get out of here so that we don't write an opinion about it. Instead, the government in the Hirabayashi case argued that Hirabayashi had waited too long to challenge the convictions and that it should be dismissed because it just didn't, it, they were moot. And the argument was, was memorable and we'll never forget it. And the government's case was essentially over when the government attorney said, admitted that the government had known the conviction was flawed for a long time. And one of the judges on the panel asked, then why didn't you do something earlier? And the government attorney responded, we didn't know anyone cared. And the audience in the courtroom exploded with gasps of disbelief. <laughs> So it was my good uh, fortune to be assigned to write the opinion. The most senior judge on the panel, Ted Goodwin, uh, could have assigned it to himself, but he was a World War II veteran who had seen action in the Pacific, who remembered Pearl Harbor vividly, and I don't think he felt quite comfortable writing an opinion that o would overrule the wartime Supreme Court. So I got to do it. And I worked harder on that opinion than I've ever worked on any other opinion in my life. I turned my office into a, uh, into a library on World War II and the internment. Uh, the issue was really whether or not the whole matter was moot because, because as the government argued, Hirabayashi was no longer aggrieved by his convictions. And I tried so hard to be eloquent and I not really very good at it, but I wrote one good sentence. And that sentence was that a United States citizen who is convicted of a crime on account of race is lastingly aggrieved. And the government did not appeal the Hirabayashi case. This made Gordon Hirabayashi furious because he wanted to take his case to the Supreme Court and have the Supreme Court acknowledge that it was wrong in his case. I told, kept telling Gordon that he shouldn't run after the train after he caught it and that um, it was not at all clear in the 1980s that the Supreme Court would overrule what it had written in the, during the wartime. Uh, but a couple of years ago, I went to Seattle for the opening of a of a uh, apartment building that is named after Gordon Hirabayashi and a mural uh, that's on the window in that apartment building that has a portrait of, done by a very prominent uh, Japanese American artist is a portrait of of Gordon Hirabayashi and the scales of justice and, and, and my little picture in there too and on in front of that building is a wooden bench. This is very symbolic. It's a bench, a wooden bench, and inscribed in that bench, symbolizing the courts and the law, is my little sentence of a United States citizen who is convicted of a crime on account of race, is lastingly aggrieved, and with the pin sight to the federal reporter. And I thought that was about the coolest thing that I ever saw in my life. So I've been asked, what, I was asked, what, what are the lessons that we should, we'll discuss this perhaps a little later, and I know that Karen uh, has devoted her life to this. But there is a national memorial to the internment. It's, it's, it's located in Washington, D.C. I think it should be on the West Coast, but it's in Washington, north of the Capitol. And it's a sculpture, a lovely sculpture of two cranes. And one is struggling to fly free of the strands of barbed wire, and one crane is flying above the, the barbed wire. And the words engraved on, on it are those of a great Japanese American who fought heroically for our country in World War II uh, from Hawaii, Senator Daniel Inouye. And the words are, 
the lessons learned must remain as a grave reminder of what we must not allow to happen again to any group. And that is the lesson of the wartime Japanese internment cases. And I thank you, and I will turn it over to my good friend, uh, Karen, who will tell you how she has spent her life. Good, there's room up here. Good evening. Arizona has become like a magnet for me. It, I, I kind of keep coming back. Um, and uh, uh, this is uh, my day here, I have to tell you, I'll start off with, has been unbelievable, thanks to Judge Gass. And I, we spent most of the morning um, speaking with uh, senators and uh, then went to the Bar Association luncheon, um, met with um, the, uh, from Christine Burton from the Burton Foundation. Um, basically, I had uh, like five minutes to just change my clothes and get here. And, and actually, th this morning I was wearing orange, and now I'm wearing red, see? And, and then when we went to the Capitol this morning, um, all these teachers are in red, but at least I had orange, so I thought, well, okay, I'll get there eventually. I mean, it's uh, uh, my, kind of my signature color, but I was very honored to, uh, to sit in the gallery uh, and be introduced by um, your Senator Yi um, on, on, you know, uh, to, to everyone there in the gallery and on the floor and to be recognized uh, in, in, in recognizing my, my father. So it's been an unbelievable day and I'm thrilled to be with you here this evening on, on Law Day. Judge Gass is the one that, that you know, kind of turned my arm and said, you will come, right? <laughs> I said, of course, of course. Um, I spoke at the uh, Arizona Asian American Bar Association uh, dinner last year, and actually I have worked with the uh, Mesa Unified School District uh, and, uh, and hope to have more interactions with uh, Arizona and the schools here. Um, so, uh, but it's interesting because um, Judge Schroeder says, my life's work. Well, actually, the story is, um, I, was, I was born in, in the San Francisco Bay Area in Oakland, so my father was also born in, in Oakland, California, and was therefore an American citizen. Uh, and, uh, and so um, my brother and I were both born, born in the Bay Area. And this is um, after the war. Everyone keeps asking me, well, which camp were you born in? And I say, I wasn't born yet. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I'm in high school and uh, 16 years old and studying uh, U.S. government. And our teacher assigns a, a little paperback book of a different subject for each of my classmates to read. And the uh, um, the assignment at that time was then to get up in front of the, our class and give an oral book report. It was a long time ago. I mean, they don't do that anymore. Uh, and my, I went to a high school, though, that was um, basically you know, Caucasian, I mean, the, the, the majority. Uh, we, my father, you know, he not only had um, uh, housing discrimination and he had employment discrimination, so no one, um, a realtors back in the Bay Area didn't sell to uh, Asian Americans. Uh, you always had to buy a house through a third party. And so this high school was about 2,500 kids, and there was only about six Asian Americans and maybe two African Americans, and that was it. And my my friend Maya, uh, third generation Sansei, uh, I've known her since I was five years old. And so she gets up in front of the class, and her book is called Concentration Camps USA. I thought, oh, hmm, that's interesting title. And then she starts talking about the Japanese American internment. And I thought, oh, what's that about? And then she explains that time in history. And then she goes on to say, but there was this one man who resisted the military orders. And uh, it ended, ended up to be a landmark Supreme Court case called Korematsu versus the United States. <laughs> oh, that's my name. 
and I have, you know, 35 pairs of eyes turning around looking at me, and I'm shrugging my shoulders and thinking it's some black sheep of the family because she never said Fred. And so, you know, I just, as kids do in class, you just kind of tune out, you just, your eyes glaze over, and I'm thinking, who is this, who is this? And uh, after class, um, my, um, uh, my friend Maya uh, told me, this is about your dad. And I said, no way, somebody would have told me. So I go running home and asking my mother, and she says, <clears throat> yes, this is about your father, and gives me the standard answer, you'll have to wait until he gets home and ask him. So it was long hours, and it was 8 o'clock by that time, and I had calmed down. And, uh, and, and he got very quiet, and he said, it happened a long time ago, and what he did, he thought was right, and the government was wrong. That clear and simple. And I could see this hurt go over his face, and I couldn't ask him any more questions, except uh, I did ask him, uh, can he vote? Could he vote? Because voting was very, I don't know why, but my voting was very important to my parents, probably something that happened in class. And he said, yes, he could vote. Uh, and so, you know, my other, my other message uh, as I speak all over this country is make sure you register to vote and to vote. Right, and also our census is very important. So uh, I, t I tell that even to, to, to students to, to go home and ask their parents, you know, are you registered to vote? Make sure they're voting. Their grandparents help each other because uh, that's what's going to take them to uh, to make change. And uh, and so the irony to the story is that my brother found out the same way about my father's Supreme Court case in high school. I mean, obviously, we didn't have dinner talk. <laughs> uh, and we didn't speak about it again until 1983. So it was 1983 when, actually in 82, when we found the evidence in Washington, D.C. But um, that's when my father's case was, was reopened. And when uh, Professor Peter Ayers, who's also one of, who also found the kind of the smoking gun, he found the document uh, from the Department of Justice in, in not in uh, you know, American or U.S. citizen files, in the immigration naturalization files of all places, uh, that basically said, uh, the memo that said, we are lying to the Supreme Court. So at, the, at that time, the evidence you know, proved that they had, um, the Department of Justice had lied to the Supreme Court, uh, had withheld evidence and destroyed evidence. So who knows what the decision would have been if the Supreme Court truly had the had all the information. And so it was the researcher that um, Judge Schroeder referred to as Aiko Yoshinaga. And, and Peter and, and, um, and Aiko just happened to meet in doing this research and finding out, you know, this, this one had this file and this one had this file. And, and then they discovered what they had. Uh, and then Professor Peter Irons um, actually spoke to, um, to Gordon first and then also Minyasui, who was the other Supreme Court case. And, and went down to, was contacting the ACLU because it was um, Mr. Bessick, uh, who was then the executive director of Northern California Affiliate, that visited my father in jail and asked him if he would be willing to take um, his case. Uh, and Mr. Bessick said, if need be, all the way to the Supreme Court. And my father said, yes. Um, and, but, but uh, Peter had found from the ACLU that my father really didn't want to talk about his case. He, I remember growing up that he received telephone calls from law students and they were to interview him and he just, it was just too painful. Um, he had one experience about two years after I graduated from high school, and this is uh, like 1969, when uh, um, actually it was Gordon Hirabayashi's um, brother, Jim Hirabayashi, uh, that was at UC Berkeley and convinced my, my father to speak to the students at an ethnic studies um, uh, class or unit off campus. 
So ethnic studies wasn't even recognized at UC Berkeley. You know, the, the issue of the ethnic studies case here in Tucson, right? Uh, and it was you know, really quite interesting. But um, UC Berkeley students, being UC Berkeley students, were not very kind to my father. They were really like, well, why didn't you be angry? And why aren't you mad? And why aren't you, why aren't you out there just being outrageous? And, and my father wasn't like that. You know, he was, um, as, as Judge Schroeder knows, a very kind uh, and soft-spoken, um, humble person that if, you know, he'd give you the shirt off his back if you, if you needed it. Uh, and he never even swore a bad word in his mouth. I mean, I, from his mouth. I can swear like a trooper, but not my, my, not my parents. Uh, and, and he just, um, he just was a very gentle soul. But he lived by his principles of right and wrong. Now, not everyone can do that. And, and, uh, and he really uh, lived his life um, you know, with, with conviction and, and, and really civic engagement. He was, you know, my parents were involved in Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and church, and, and he was part of, he was um, um, a member of the International Lions Club for um, 50 years and president twice and, and you know, was always giving back to the community. And so he d demonstrated his civic engagement. Um, he didn't sit us down, my brother and I, and say, you know, this is what you need to do. But he, he demonstrated what it is to be an American citizen by his, his actions. So after that bad experience, and that's why my mother wouldn't let me to go to UC Berkeley, um, he never wanted to speak about it again. And so uh, it was not until 1983 that... Um, I learned then that my father had never given up hope that someday he could reopen his case, but he didn't know how to do that. Uh, and you have to realize that when you know, he had his, he, he was arrested in San Leandro in the Bay Area on, on May 30th, um, 1942, and he had his bail hearing. He was sent actually to the Presidio, where it was the Fourth Army um, base. That's where General um, John DeWitt's office was, and uh, it was sent to the prison there. We're still kind of researching the the prison, uh, and then sent over to the Tanfran. A detention assembly center. Uh, it was a waste track. So that's where the government put people. They found waste tracks. If they couldn't find a ra an independent waste track, they found waste tracks in in um, in fairgrounds and in some sports centers. And they were just, you know, they were the the, the, the waste tracks were. Um, just whitewashed, uh, dirt floor, gaps in the in the walls. You had a iron cot. You got a, 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 a like a, a, a sack, a sleeve that you had to, to stuff with with hay. That was your bed and a light bulb, and that was it. And you know we treated we treat animals better than we treated the the Japanese Americans. It was it was it was inhumane, uh, and and so. You know, when my father got there after being in jail, he said, gee, jail was a lot better than this. But you know, the, the, the community Japanese men decided that they were going to have a meeting about whether or not my father should carry on with his case. So they all met underneath the bleachers with my father's oldest brothers and didn't invite my dad. So afterwards, my dad said, well, what was the outcome of the meeting? And um, my father's oldest brother said, uh, Fred, we don't think that you should uh, continue on because uh, you might make it bad for the rest of us. And, and so my father was um, vilified and ostracized from day one um, in 1942. And he had bought, you know, for the families, um, you can imagine, my father had brought shame to the family. My grandfather was disgusted and my grandmother cried. And no one wanted anything to do with my, my dad. So, you know, but he never gave up hope. And uh, it's, it's really something to be said that uh, he believed in, in the Constitution uh, and, and, uh, and our civil rights. 
and the Supreme Court. So he thought for sure by the time that his case went you know, to the Supreme Court, and this is 1944, so next year will be the 75th anniversary of my father's decision, that the Supreme Court would see that it was unconstitutional. And he was, he was really disgusted when, when, uh, when the decision was, was um, still against him. Now, you know, the three dissenting opinions um, are, are the most relevant today. And you know, Justice Jackson said, this lies around like a loaded weapon ready for anyone to pick up and use with a plausible cause. Well, after 9-11, they cited my father's Supreme Court case um, as a possible reason to round up Arab and Muslim Americans and put them in American concentration camps. Uh, you know, Justice, um, Justice Murphy called it the ugly abyss of racism, and Justice Owen Roberts said this is unconstitutional. Justice Owen Roberts and Justice Murphy called it, you know, referred to the camps as concentration camps, and even President Roosevelt referred to the camps as concentration camps. So this was this was what was happening at the time, and my you know my father um, you some of you may not know but towards the end of the war I mean the government you know as, as Judge Schroeder said you know, knew that the 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 Japanese Americans were not dangerous there was never any evidence of any espionage or spying so the fact that there was the Ringo report from the U S Navy the J, uh, J Edgar Hoover of all people, um, FBI said there was no evidence, the FCC said there was no evidence of any espionage or spying. Uh, but the government was never going to admit that they were wrong. And so towards the end of the war, you could, you know, the community, some of the community people went in to help people get jobs, and you could go east. You couldn't go west until the, the, uh, uh, the war was over. And so that's how my father went, ended up in Detroit, Michigan, and met my mother uh, from, um, from, from South Carolina. Uh, she, they were just a, a real team, and she was a Caucasian woman. So uh, it, it was really amazing because she read about my father's Supreme Court case in the Japanese American Citizens League uh, paper, the Pacific Citizen, before she even met him. So she knew the outcome of, of the case. Uh, and, and my mother met her first Japanese American person, Elma Takahashi, that, uh, that um, they became fast friends. And so when they, my parents were married in 1946, um, Elma was my mother's maid of honor. And, uh, and then they, they moved back to, to California because my grandmother wasn't well. So that's how we ended up in, in, in the Bay Area. But it, um, in the day in, in, in court um, was really like the day in court that the Japanese Americans that were incarcerated, you know, never were able to have because, you know, as many of you know, due process of law was all denied. And um, my, my father, um, before Judge Marilyn Hall Patel in federal, in federal court, um, uh, in, in, this was in the ceremonial courtroom in San Francisco, the biggest courtroom. And I don't know, you know, you know Judge Patel, but she came prepared. I mean, she knew the government was, was, was wrong. And um, it's, as, she, as she said, you know, when, when they don't confess error, uh, you know, they're, they're clearly, you know, have made a, a, a big mistake. And my father was able to uh, make a statement before the court, and he said that he had come in, into the court in handcuffs, and uh, that court in, in 1942. And he said, quote, according to the Supreme Court decision regarding my case, being an American citizen was not enough. They say you have to look like one. Otherwise, they say you can't tell a difference between a loyal and disloyal American. I thought this decision was wrong, and I still feel that way. As long as my record stands in federal court, any American citizen can be held in prison or concentration camps without a trial or hearing. That is, if they look like the enemy of our country. Therefore, I would like to see the government admit that they were wrong and do something about it so this will never happen again to any American citizen of any race, creed, or color, unquote. Sorry. <laughs> um, 
so I was I took that chance to really get, really get emotional. So, um, but that's how much my father believed in this country. And when his conviction was overturned on August 10, 1983, he could have very well said to the Japanese American community, you know, you didn't want anything to do with me, why should I have anything to do with you? But he wasn't like that. And uh, he attended, you know, any JCL event and any other event that he was invited to and crisscrossed the country to make sure that people learned about the incarceration because he just didn't want something like this to happen again. Uh, and, you know, here we are, you know, 75 years later um, dealing with, with really the same issues. You know, in, in, in 1942, um, you know, racial profiling was wrong. In, in 2018, racial profiling and religious profiling is wrong. And basically, that's, that's, it's, it's, it's that simple. Uh, and my father would be very upset to see what's, what, what's happening in, in this country um, at this time. Um, but he, he, uh, he that, it's, but that didn't, didn't stop him. And, you know, and so that's why it's important to, um, you know, to, to educate people. Um, that's why I have the Fred T. Korematsu Institute is for education, uh, especially from K through 12. And I've, I've, you know, like I said, worked with, with educators here. Uh, and also, it's important, especially for Arizona, to know their own history, right? So we have um, uh, Poston Incarceration Camp and Gila River Incarceration Camp. And I would like to um, recognize a few people um, that were incarcerated uh, back in 1942. Uh, Dr. Uh, Richard um, Matsuishi, where are you? Would you please stand? So please give him a round of applause. He was in Poston when he was um, a young boy. So can you imagine, you know, children, I mean, they incarcerated children. You know, 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry, two-thirds were American citizens, citizens, and half were under the age of, of um, oh no, sorry, third of were under the age of 18. And it, to live behind barbed wire all that time was, was really uh, crim criminal and to be robbed of your youth. Um, Marion uh, Sheet uh, uh, Tadano, please stand. Um, she was incarcerated in Crystal City, Texas. Now, Crystal City, Texas was actually a Department of Justice camp. And I didn't really know that, that some Japanese Americans were incarcerated there. I thought mo mostly the other part of the story of the incarceration is, you know, the government went into Latin America and especially went into Peru and kidnapped um, uh, people of Japanese ancestry and brought them to, uh, to Texas, put them in Crystal City, um, Department of Justice camp, and the idea was to uh, use them as uh, to trade of, of prisoners of war. You know, to just use them as, as pawns in this in this in horrendous war, uh, and because um, Marion's uh, father and grandfather, um, from my understand, were community leaders. You know, they were organizers. They were really, you know, bad people. You know, just they wanted, you know, they were really criminal, weren't they? And, uh, and so that's why they were put in the, um, in the Crystal City um, incarceration camp. And, um, and, and many people that have come up, you know, from, um, from Latin America and from Mexico now have, have been put in that, in that camp as well. So it's still going on. Um, Madoy Hall. Please stand. You were born in Gila River. Oh my gosh. You were born in Gila River incarceration camp um, in August of 1942. So how would you like to have that on your birth certificate? 
Well, that's it's really it's really sad that that's what we, we you know we did it to uh, to Americans, um, and uh, and then also I'd like to um, to recognize because you know people were you know the 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 Jewish were impacted. I mean even you know the Italians the the the, the Germans were all impacted during the war, but there was someone here, um, Marion um, uh, Weinsweig. Please stand. <laughs> Marianne is a Holocaust survivor. So that's really, truly um, am amazing. And I think you were relocated reloc to Canada. Is that right? So here's another part of the incarceration story, is that there were Canadian Japanese, 20,000 that were incarcerated in, on the west coast, um, or off the west coast actually, of, 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 uh, of Canada. Um, I was just at a, um, a conference, um, Asian Bar, um, American Bar Association conference in, in Vancouver, and uh, I, I uh, went outside, about 30 minutes outside of Vancouver is the Nikkei Museum Museum. Uh, and the Kormatsu Institute uh, and the Nikkei Museum are going to partner um, in education because, you know, this is, this is the, we want everyone to know the, the full story of the impact of, of, of being racially profiled uh, and targeted, you know, during the war so that we don't keep making uh, the, the same mistakes. Uh, and so, you know, I, um, I'm probably out of time. I'm not sure what, what time I am. <laughs> I just, I keep, this is a problem with me. I just keep talking. Um, so I, I just want to talk to you a little bit about um, the, the Kormatsu Institute uh, and what we're doing. Um, I had a little bit of, we, we uh, created actually curriculum kits that we send out to teachers uh, free of charge from kindergarten to 12th grade. Uh, there's different lesson plans that they, they can use with different materials. Um, we have a new edition of our teacher's guide that has all the lesson plans, primary documents, um, photographs, uh, you can use this for English language arts, you know, history, uh, social studies, and there's other materials in there that's that's more, there's um, like a graphic novel for elementary school, and a new book for middle school, and one for, for high school, and a DVD that has a um, 24 minute uh, version of my father's two time Emmy Award documentary of civil wrongs and rights, the Fred Kwamatsu story, and some other, um, um, other smaller, uh, smaller clips of documents. Um, Moad, um, I was talking to, um, to Mary right about Moad, which is, uh, was really another Department of Justice um, camp, and there's a documentary called Bitter Legacy centered around that. So there's all these different layers of, of the story of the um, incarceration and how people were treated. Uh, but in 2000 and uh, 10, Governor Schwarzenegger, uh, a Republican, uh, signed the legislative bill creating Fred Kwamatsu Day of Civil Liberties in the Constitution for the state of, of uh, California on January 30th, which is my father's birthday. It's, uh, it's not a holiday, we're working on that, but the governor and the superintendent of public instruction uh, you know, declares a day and encourages teachers to teach their students about my father's fight for justice and, and the incarceration and how it relates to our issues today. And following suit, we have now the state of Hawaii. Uh, Virginia, Florida was a result of seventh grade students writing letters to their state senator. Uh, they wanted a fair Kwamatsu day. They really wanted a holiday, but uh, they, 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 did, they were successful in establishing for Kormatsu Day of Civil Liberties in the Constitution for Florida and even New York City. Uh, it, uh, we had that um, celebration this past January 30th uh, where we had 52 city council members from all the boroughs uh, sci uh, um, voted unanimously for, for Kormatsu Day of Civil Liberties in the Constitution. And so next step is, is um, 
New York City. So this is our, our poster that, our new poster, by, actually my brother designed this, um, that we include in our, our curriculum kits. And so actually Governor Ducey, your governor, signed a proclamation uh, this last January for the Korematsu Day of Civil Liberties in the Constitution. And uh, now uh, in the, the grassroots movement, um, if you will, is to uh, establish the Korematsu Day of Civil Liberties in the Constitution, uh, hopefully for uh, January 30th, 2019, which would be my father's 100th birthday. And if we could establish that in perpetuity, um, it would be really marvelous. So um, stay tuned. Uh, we hope to be uh, successful. And also I want to tell you that there's going to be a special exhibit uh, that uh, I've worked with the American History Museum. If you get to Washington, D.C., we have a temporary exhibit of the incarceration on, on the second floor of the, of the museum. It'll end uh, this year, but it's becoming a traveling exhibit. And I didn't know until today, um, even though I was, you know, one of the curators on the exhibit uh, that Judge uh, Goss told me that it's going to be here in January in Arizona at your old Capitol building. Is that right? So it's going to be here. And so um, I hope that you all will, will, um, will see that and, and uh, tell people so that they can understand it. And uh, I think they're going to be collecting some local artifacts as well from people to put in the uh, exhibition. So. We, um, you know, we, we want to further the education and uh, the, the core monster is to, you know, teachers can go to the website, sign up for these cooking kits free of charge. And uh, this is also the 30th anniversary of the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 that was signed by President Reagan. Uh, it's August 10th, 1988. So that was the official apology uh, that was given on behalf of the government uh, to anyone that was incarcerated. And, and even though there were some reparations and you had to be living in order to receive those, it wasn't about the reparations. It was, it was the apology because, you know, the people had carried around this shame and, uh, and this stigma. Like it was, you know, their fault for the bombing of Pearl Harbor. It's just like some of these Muslim and American kids and South Asian kids that are walking around and, and being bullied. You know, I was bullied in school and praying for the bombing of Pearl Harbor every time that picture was thrown up on December 7th. And now that's what's happening to students. And we need to stop that. We need to, to, to stop bullying and, and, to, and to stop repeating history. So if my father were here, he would say to you, remember, stand up for what is right. And when you see something wrong, don't be afraid to speak up. Thank you. Now, if any of you there have questions that you would like to put to Karen and to Judge Schroeder, we have people picking them up. We're going to take uh, questions for maybe about 20 or 25 minutes because I want to give you a chance to be able to say hello uh, to Ms. Komatsu and to Judge Schroeder afterwards. So if you have the questions, get them to me. While we're waiting for them, um, I'd like to ask both of you. Last week, the Supreme Court heard argument in Trump versus Hawaii, the challenge to the administration's third iteration of the travel ban. I know you both are familiar with the arguments, the oral argument, the briefs. Um, do you see any similarities or differences in the arguments made in that case as compared with the arguments in the Japanese internment cases? Well, the big, big difference uh, between the two cases is that the case now pending in the travel ban is about uh, immigration into the United States, whereas the Japanese internment was, uh, uh, was an exclusion of uh, American citizens, which has never happened before and I hope will never happen again. But uh, the Supreme Court case came out of the Ninth Circuit, of course, and um, it was interesting that the Supreme Court has never overruled the Korematsu case, but it has never cited it favorably. And the Ninth Circuit opinion in the travel ban case did cite the dissents 
in the Korematsu case, which I thought was quite interesting. And Karen, I know you were present for oral argument. Um, as a non-lawyer with extensive knowledge of the issues, what was your reaction to the oral argument? Uh, well, it was a very interesting experience. If you've never heard an oral argument in front of the Supreme Court, uh, just the, uh, the discourse and communication between the, the lawyers uh, on, on you know, both, both sides and the justices are, they're kind of talking over each other. They ask all these different questions and uh, it, they, they certainly focused on different you know, issues. Uh, J Justice Breyer pointed out, though, that you know this is impacting you know businesses, um, universities, scholars that want to come in, to the United States and and uh, and study or work on projects here. Uh, families, it's impacting families. So even though there, you know, it's not directly, let's say, uh, about um, uh, American citizens <coughs> per se, it is about you know, um, uh, about Americans because it does impact everyone here. You know, it, the the economics. So when you can't bring over people that for businesses that um, that it's impacting the businesses here. You know, it is it, it is um, it is an issue. And uh, they did. You know, I was hoping they would talk more about Korematsu. They they didn't. Um, uh, even though I signed on to an amicus brief, a friends of the court brief. Um, and, and kind of to make the court aware that we, what we wanted to do was just to remind the court of, um, of you know, of, of um, not letting the executive uh, branch have, be, you know, have overreach um, and telling the Supreme Court what they could, you know, what they could decide on. Uh, that was, you know, part of our, our reminder. And just to remind the, the court of the history of the uh, incarceration of our father's uh, Supreme Court cases, uh, even like Judge Schroeder said, my father's case is on, still on the Supreme Court, um, as the other two, uh, it's, you know, it's been discredited, but it, it, it could still be used by even the president to, um, to round up a group of people and put them in, you know, in some incarceration camp. So it's these are the issues that we wanted the, the court to um, to to address, and it, it they they were talking about uh, I guess the um, you know how much of a how broad I guess the um, the ban is and, and what it and the limitations also was there limitations to it so they were asking kind of those types of questions right Karen. Um, it sounds as if your family worked hard to come to terms with the fact that you and other members of, of other people of Japanese ancestry were put in the internment camps. How did you do that? What factors um, made it even possible to, or maybe to come to terms or to not? Well, my, my father has been my inspiration. And because he was never bitter or angry or blamed anyone, uh, you know, it, it, I guess that's that's what I, I learned. Or, or you know, I watched by sometimes you learn from your parents just not what they say, by just watching them by example. And uh, and actually, you know, this this is this is I didn't choose this. <laughs> this is I had a former life. Uh, I, I, which sounds funny, but I used to design hotels and restaurants, so I had a business. But my father gave me this charge to carry on with education five months before he passed away. He, I, fortunately, I was able to travel with my parents. Um, I had a very flexible kind of uh, job and a very supportive husband. So I went to, to, play, to places like this, law schools, organizations, and heard my father speak because I didn't sit him down and go, Daddy, tell me from start to finish, you know, your experience. He, um, you know, it, it's what he told the audience. And I learned something new every time because he never read from a script. Uh, and it, that's, that's how I learned about his experiences and what was in his, what, what was in his heart. And so that's, you know, he was my inspiration. I had to be coaxed. I mean, my, actually, it was my father's legal team, Coram Novus legal team, who worked on my father's case pro bono. Actually, the Coram Novus teams 
work together for um, Yasui Hirabashi and Korematsu. They, they shared all this information, so um, the legal team they were working in each state, but they all shared the information and they thought that perhaps they had like three bites of the apple. They were brilliant lawyers, And too. they were brilliant lawyers. And if I, can, if I can just add, because I didn't know Fred Korematsu well, but I did meet him. I did know Gordon Hirabayashi. But Fred Korematsu, if you just met him, if you saw him in a room, he was just, it just he just projected strength. That it, it, and I, I, that must have come through in your family and helped you deal with, with this. Because these men, young men, stood up against the United States government in a time of war. And they also stood up, as Karen as, as, against the pressures of their own community and their own their parents' culture, and this is this takes so much courage. And I've always said that it it, it shows not that they were Japanese Americans, but they were Americans. It mm -hmm. was it was this American spirit in them that caused them to have this courage. I think. We have a question here about sort of process, and uh, Judge Schroeder, I'll set, give this to you. The question is: If an executive order or law is unconstitutional. Why can't the Supreme Court rule on it without a lawsuit being filed? Well, because the because the Supreme Court can only decide cases or controversies, and so they have to have a case brought uh, to them. And so that's why there are uh, a lot of good people in this country, good lawyers, who are uh, bringing test cases to the Supreme Court in order to test some of our laws that uh, may. Uh, be uh, felt by some to be unfair or unconstitutional or denial of equal protection. And Karen, somebody wants to know why it was only uh, Japanese Americans who lived south of Van Buren. I think it was south of Van Buren and west of Grand Avenue in Phoenix. Like why, why, why there was this dividing line in the city? Uh, General uh, John DeWitt, uh, first um, in the military, uh, created what was called Zone 1. So zone, the military zone, so it was zone one. And zone one was half of, of, um, of Washington uh, you know, to the west, um, half of Oregon to the west. And then they even divided up California um, vertically and, and to, the, to the west, and then half of Arizona. So when you divided up Arizona, because you know, they wanted to be, it was basically the west coast that they were, they, you know, they were forcibly removing Japanese Americans. Uh, then the um, uh, then the military decided no, they needed all of California, uh, which was too bad. Which was really sad because actually the farmers on the that looked like a Mount Monterey um, on the um, and closer to the to the bay thought if they moved their farming over to um, uh, California near Nevada that they could still farm. But then they got caught in that catch twenty two and. And uh, so that's why is they, the military only wanted to control those areas that, um, that, you know, that were closest to the West Coast because they always thought that um, you know, J Japan was going to come and invade the West Coast. Yeah, but in Phoenix, the, the main Japanese community was south of Van Buren. Yeah, they ran yeah. the uh, flower gardens and they were just very beautiful near South Mountain. Right. And so it was. That, that that dividing line just targeted most of the Jap uh, the Japanese American community. Well, when I when I spoke here um, a couple years ago at the museum, uh, 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 I think I need to say Lady told me that the story of of Phoenix being divided kind of in half, and then if you the like for um, she remembers um, students that or families that lived. Uh, let's say um, east of that demarcation line, um, but the students went to school on the west side. Well, they once the orders were given, the exclusion orders were given, they couldn't go to school on the west side, right? So then they had to find other schools that they could go to, which they had their own issues of, of experiences of bullying and being uh, unaccepted in those kinds of in the schools. So there there was there was so much conflict in and. Uh, and no one could, you know, make a decision as far as the, the right and wrong of all of it. I'd like you both to answer this question. Uh, somebody knows, Karen, that you said your father showed his life through his actions. 
What actions do you think attorneys and law students can do in honor of his life? Well, the first word that comes to mind is pro bono. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I didn't even know that. You know, pro bono means like you know, working, um, you know, basically free of charge, right? So I didn't even know about that term until we met the legal team. I never had heard that before. Uh, we didn't even know any lawyers. In fact, my father. That's why my father kept looking for someone to help. But he, you know, attorneys were too expensive. Um, and but now that I've I've worked um, with all these um, legal nonprofit organizations, um, and 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 the, oh the uh, the heartwarming um, uh, scene. Um, I mean, unfortunately, when the president <coughs> issued the first Muslim ban on on January twenty seventh last year, and you had all these attorneys going to the airports. Remember that picture? Mm -hmm. Going to the airports and with signs. I mean, some were real estate attorneys who never <laughs> even practiced any type of, of immigration law, right? And they were saying, "I am an attorney. I am here to help you." It was, it, and and everyone was there without. I mean, there was. You know, my father, what I said, well, the, the real phrase was protest but not with violence, otherwise they won't listen to you. Uh, and everyone was there and, and, and you know, they were certainly chanting and, and, and protesting, but it wasn't violent. And all these attorneys that were there to help. So if everyone gave just a little bit, you know, and it happens, you know, it doesn't happen all at once. It happens during your, your lifetime. You know, I, I'm at an age now where you know when you're, you have a young family, you can't do what you what you would like to do as a volunteer. But maybe when you're older and you you've got more time and you can do that. And and to help with organizations, you know, there's uh, there's all these um, nonprofit legal organizations around that you know even if it's for your law firm or even if you're working independently, uh, you can you can uh, volunteer maybe you know six hours a week. I mean, six hours a week is a lot. You know, I can tell you from working with the Asian Law Caucus, um, it's it's or mentoring. Um, you know, finding um, even law students uh, or, or you know that are like one L's. I mean, goodness, remember when you were in one L? I mean, that's you know if that's. And I keep telling students now, you don't need to volunteer too much because you need to study. You know, one L is like very difficult. But you can you can do your volunteering at various times, and I, I think for for young attorneys and for law students and being involved and listen, working across communities. Let's not stay in our <coughs> silos, right? We need to work across communities and and to learn you know and share our differences and have um, students learn about who we are and what we represent and how we can help each other because at the end of the day. We're all Americans, and we're all in this together, and we want a life better for, for our families now and future generations. I would just add to that that um, get, out, get into the schools yeah. and talk to young children. The children don't understand our history at all, and it's not uh, being taught uh, in, in a way that they can understand, but for students who are closer to them, in, in a lot of ways, can get into the schools and really communicate, and communicate with your with your uh, with your legislators and your representatives and the people in government, um, and explain to them what you see in the community. Judge Schroeder, um, the question here is: Do you think that if people, United States citizens, are not mindful of overreach by the executive branch of government? that someone could end up putting U.S. citizens that disagree with the government in prison? Well, that's why we have courts, <laughs> is to prevent that from happening, because, um, uh, because then that's what, the, that's what the Bill of Rights is about, and that's why, why the federal courts are such an important, important uh, uh, barrier to uh, government overreaching and treating uh, and citizens improperly. So uh, support your courts. And that's again one of the reasons that Law Day and the celebration of our justice system is so important. We do depend on our courts to protect these basic rights guaranteed in the Bill of Rights, guaranteed in state constitutions as well as in federal constitutions. And that's what we look to when 
Occasionally things go awry, but usually, as I said, it tends toward justice, and usually I think the courts get it right when we're protecting these individual rights. Um, but that the, lesson is sometimes they get it wrong, and the, the judgment of history has to come around. That's right. Sometimes they get it wrong, and, and sometimes it takes a long time to find a way to get it right, and, and then we have uh, brave and qualified judges like Judge Schroeder and her colleagues who find a way to get things right, and it's it's an important part of our democracy. There's no other court system exactly like ours, and so it's a, as we think about how things happen in this country, it's important to, to recognize the value and the essential nature of the courts. Um, Karen, somebody is wondering, what was the turning point in the Japanese American community kind of welcoming back your father into the fold? Well, when his conviction was um, overturned and vacated on November, November 10th, 1983. So that was, that was um, actually um, also kind of this weight lifted off his shoulders. You know, my father, it's interesting that, that my, my father, when he lost his case in 1944, the Supreme Court case, he felt like he left down his own, let down his own community, even though his community didn't want anything to do with him. So he, he just, he became this different person. I mean, it, it's, you know, when you have, you carry around it's something that you feel responsible for and somehow it's lifted from you, it's, your life is, is you rejuvenated. Uh, and, uh, and that's what happened to him. And uh, I think he, he wanted to share that with everyone. He, when he received the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1998, he didn't do so just for himself. You know, he received all these honors and awards on behalf of his Japanese American community. And, and the only two people that he wished that could have seen this was his parents. Mm -hmm. You know, because, you know, like I said, he brought shame to his, his parents. And, um, you know, he was the, quote, the troublemaker. And, uh, it, and you know, it, 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 really, it really was um, important for him to also, also to be with his community. He, he, that's the way he was all, all his life, really. Judge Schroeder, as a judge, you decide cases on the basis of the law, facts presented to you, but there often is, at the end of a case, or a, a sort of a personal connection to some special cases. Have you maintained a personal connection with some of the people involved in the Hirabayashi case? Well, yes. I, I, um, I stayed in touch with uh, Gordon Hirabayashi. Uh, he, he, he actually moved to Canada, mm -hmm. spent the rest of his life in Canada. And uh, when, um, when I was receiving some award someplace, my mentor, John Frank, found Gordon Hirabayashi in Canada and oh. brought him to the dinner at, that the ABA was having. Oh, wow. And he, be, he totally stole the show from <laughs> him, <laughs> in the whole place. And he regaled us with all these stories. And I, he was just a remarkable person because when he, he was in, um, when his conviction was, was upheld by the Supreme Court, he was determined that he would serve his sentence. Yes. And he, the government it was the middle of the war. The government had no way to transport him to the to the prison camp that he was supposed to serve a sentence, which happened to be on Mount Lemon in Arizona. In, in Arizona, yeah. And so he hitchhiked from <laughs> Seattle to Mount Lemon. And when he got there, they, they said, oh, we don't have you on our list. Just a minute, go see a movie and come back. So he went and <laughs> came back. He was determined that he would serve that sentence. And I was with him when, he, uh, when they dedicated a rest area on Mount Lemon, at the site where, he was, uh, where his prison camp was, and named it after him. And he, he was so moved by that that it was just a wonderful thing. And um, recently, um, I saw the, I don't know how many of you, or whether any of you saw the, the, uh, the play in New York, uh, Allegiance, mm -hmm. which is by uh, George Takai, mm -hmm. um, who was what, Mr. Zulu. Yeah, Zulu, Zulu is, is the star, star Trek. Trek. Star Trek. <laughs> and uh, one, of, one of my former law clerks knew the fellow who wrote the book for that. 
And so I went to see the show before it closed. They made a film of it, mm -hmm. and it's been shown. But I saw the actual play with George Takai, and I waited outside uh, with my friend for him to come. But we got backstage privileges and backstage privileges, and I waited for him to come out. And everybody was told, no pictures, no pictures. And he came out, and my friend went up to him and said, you know, this is the judge who wrote the Hirabayashi case. And so he looked at me, and he went, and he threw his arms around me and said, we've got to get a picture. We've got to get a picture. <laughs> and he proceeded to tell me the story of the Korematsu case. And he said, then you know what happened? They found the stuff and they, 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 yeah. they told me. He started telling me the whole thing. And I said, you know, and, and my friend said, you know, she wrote that opinion. Yeah. <laughs> but it was just, yeah. he was. But he, he felt so strongly about yes. his experience <laughs> yes. uh, as a young person. And my own colleague, uh, whom I'm very fond, uh, Wally Tashima, was uh, on the Ninth Circuit, was interned in the, the Gila River when he was about eight years old. And he never spoke about it for many years. And then finally, at a, a judicial conference, he opened up and talked about his experiences. And he said, as an eight-year-old, it didn't. He was, it was sort of uh, maybe. A, had some good times, he played baseball, they walked eight miles to the river to, to go swimming, but he said uh, his family had been quite prosperous in California, and he described coming back, and there, and there was just nothing there, mm, yeah. absolutely nothing there. Yeah. And that was one of the most, when he spoke at this judicial conference with the thousand lawyers and judges who think that they know everything, and you could not, you could hear a pin drop, it was just so, eye-opening for them, and that was about 1990s. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, I've, I've just been, my life has been enriched by all of the people I've known who have been so courageous right. about this experience. Yeah. And that leads to another area of some interest, and that is what proportion or how likely was it that um, people who were interned recovered their land, their property, their homes, their businesses? Uh, they didn't. They didn't. Uh, maybe you know one percent. Uh, my, I mean, my grandfather was was very fortunate that even he had bought uh, uh, land before the alien land law took into effect on August tenth, nineteen thirteen. So after that time, if you were an immigrant, you couldn't buy land. And that's in East Oakland, uh, California. He had been able to build a flower nursery in the house. And, and when, when he knew he would have to leave the property, he went to the bank. And it was a Portuguese immigrant who, uh, who said that he would rent out the property. And uh, I mean, of course, when he, so he got it back after the war, but it was in rack and ruin. And, but for a lot of families, and fortunately, this banker paid um, the... Um, uh, um, the mortgages, right? There was more taxes and 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 uh, mortgages, and so people that had you know any type of land, if they didn't pay their taxes, you know, here you are in prison. How are you going to pay your taxes, right? And so they would lose their they would, they would lose their properties, and um, you know people you know people went um, you know went east, and 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 after the war was over, I mean. Well, for some of you who don't know, when people left camps, they were given $25 and a bus ticket to start over, and that was it. You know, it was, it was really hum inhumane, and people went to churches and, you know, lived together and um, helped each other, uh, you know, start over. Uh, and so those were kind of the, uh, the situations. But that's why when, when, the, when the Redress and Reparations Movement um, uh, was started, and because my father's case had been vacated and uh, overturned in '83, it helped to set the precedent for the for the for the redress and reparations in the Civil Liberties Act that was was passed. Uh, but they, you know, they had they wanted some type of, of monetary compensation. Now, if you if you don't have a significant amount of of compensation, uh, it doesn't really relate to what you've lost. It's that you want you want to bring attention to the magnitude of, of the loss, right? And so first of all, first it was fifty thousand dollars, and then Congress was going, oh no, that's too much money, of course. And so they finally settled, you know, to compromise on twenty thousand um, dollars, and then we were able to actually create the Civil Liberties Public Education Fund, which was we wanted education. That was what was really important. Um, but then that 
that money kind of ran out and Congress wouldn't, wouldn't give any more money for that. So it, it, you know, but in most cases, people just lost everything. I mean, can you imagine you, 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 you have to leave your home. I, I thought, I thought about my grandmother and she, you know, she was this elegant lady and came over from Japan and this is the land of opportunity and raised a family and worked really hard in the flower industry and she's got to pack up and only take with her what she can basically carry in two hands and has to leave everything behind or you sell it on 10 cents on the dollar or leave it for friends. I mean, some people left possessions with friends hoping that they would get some of it back when they returned. No, some people didn't think that, that the Japanese Americans were ever coming back. I mean, there are some good stories where some uh, and the Caucasian farmers farmed land for the Japanese Americans and the, the money, they, any money that they were able to um, earn from the land, um, they kept separate, they paid for the cost of running the property. And there are many people in the Sacramento area of California that, that came back and then the landowner gave, gave whatever money that he had back to the Japanese Americans um, so that they could, you know, try to pick up and, and carry on with their business. But so the property was vandalized. Yeah, but it was vandalized. I mean, our, my father, my grandfather's family was uh, um, property was totally vandalized, and, uh, and so that was you know plants were stolen and glass was broken and greenhouses were, were smashed and that sort of thing. So it was it was really horrific. Mm -hmm. I think this is a good time. I'm sorry I didn't get to all the questions. If it makes you feel any better, I didn't get to ask but one of mine. So I tried to keep them in pretty much the order that we got them. But um, Karen and Judge Schroeder will be here. We have cookies and water and lemonade. Uh, you're all welcome to come and have some and to talk with them further as we stay here for a little bit longer. So thank you all very much for coming. Thank you, Judge Scott.